What's up, my brothers? In a comment in a recent video of mine, a gentleman asked me to comment on the notion of this new toxic feminist movement about decentering men. I have not heard of decentering men before, so I went on a Google spree and found out what decentering men means. Well, it's interesting. I think what I'll do is I'll just read you the highlights from this article. It looks a little bit longer than what it actually is because it printed up in large font, but let's get right into this. So this is uh, from earlier this year. This is the number one trending post on Google right now for the keyword search, Decentering Men. And this one here has five ways to focus on yourself and putting your career, family, goals, friends, and fitness first, and men last. So the first thing that it says over here is, decide that your teen years and your 20s belong to you. It says, don't actively look for a man just yet. Do you know who you are? Most women don't even know who they are, what they want, because they are still growing. According to research, the prefrontal cortex of the brain develops between 18 and 30. That's the area of the brain responsible for planning complex cognitive behavior, decision-making, and moderating social behavior. Seems pretty reasonable so far. It's safe to say that better decisions are made once this part of the brain is more developed. Research also shows that getting married between the age of 28 and 32 is linked to lower likelihood of divorce. It's called the Goldilocks zone. So by 28, you know a lot more about yourself and you can what you can and cannot accept. It goes on to say you can test the waters of career paths, housing locations, friendships. You might discover you love minimalism and neutral colors. You might decide that you want to spend the rest of your life halfway across the world from where you currently live. All right. Okay, so, so far it's pretty reasonable, but this is where it starts to get weird. Follow your dreams and celebrate your wins is point number two. In many cultures around the world, women are discouraged from making progress in life out of fear that few men will want an accomplished woman. Men need to feel needed. It's not that men don't want an accomplished woman. It's that men don't want to deal with a disagreeable boss bitch that spends all of her time chasing uh, excellence, climbing a corporate ladder. You know, the notion that toxic feminism says things like, you know, go and get a career and take care of yourself so you don't need a man. Basically says, go and serve a man in the corporate world, line his pockets with gold, but don't serve a family or a husband at home essentially is what they drive at. She says women are discouraged from living on their own and buying property. They are told they should wait for their husband to come first. They are told not to chase away prospective suitors with their success. Some of these things are actually reasonable. The problem here is women cannot control when the right man will come around. Well, <laughs> this is true, but you can also develop yourself into the kind of woman that the right man will want to seek and want to invite into his life. And I think that's being missed here. He might come in one year, he might come in five years or never. To be honest with you, the way that toxic feminism runs is it tends to push them away or eliminates them as a potential mate because of the behaviors that toxic feminism encourages women to adopt. It basically teaches women to become terrible versions of men. You know, often on shows when I run podcasts, you know, you can ask a gal what she brings to the table and she'll say things like, well, I've got a degree in this and I have a good job and I have a car and I'm able to solve problems. And it's like, she'll go on and on describing things that are essentially what a good man is. What makes a man a good man and being good at a man is what they end up describing. And that's not what men are attracted to. Women are attracted to beauty objects and women are essentially beauty objects to men and men are success objects to women. And I think that it's okay that we can compliment each other in that way. But what this article is starting to demonstrate is the standard narratives around toxic feminism. She goes on to say it would be simply foolish for a woman to refrain from investing in a home or a car or accomplishing other things simply because she's waiting for a man. That doesn't really make any sense, you know, waiting for a man. Like, what does that mean? Sitting around at the bus stop waiting for a man, sitting somewhere waiting for the right man to show up? I don't know what that insinuates. She says, as a woman, consider what makes you happy. Think about other things besides a relationship. For example, I love cozy spaces. I want to have an apartment decorated to my taste. This is like the standard basic chick today in Toronto or any other big city. It's She lives in her little apartment with her decorations, mostly from Ikea, with fluffy frou-frou stuff and canvas prints on the wall that say things like love and this house is insert whatever narrative it needs to look like. You get the idea. Mentally, I love having a clear mind. I love having a few goals and chasing after them with all of me. I hate having too much on my plate, she says. The truth is a lot of what would make us happy has has nothing to do with a man. It's funny because on the first page here with her circles, she has career, family, goals, fitness, and friends. And as part of family, you kind of need a man to have children, don't you? 
Doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? So she closes point number two off with further your education, find your tribe, start a business, buy that house, get a car, or travel to that country. If you can't figure it out, then create your framework for happiness. Doesn't say anything about preserving your value as a woman, you know, beautifying yourself, making yourself more attractive, not sharing yourself with hundreds of men. You know, stuff like that. Point number three, stick it to the male gaze. This is where it starts to get really gross. Learn how to be comfortable with being ugly, in quotation she puts. Pretty privilege is a social concept that stipulates that more attractive people have more friends, money, and success than their less attractive counterparts. This is even more true for women. Since the beginning of time, we were taught to cater to the male gaze and crave male validation. I can hear some people going, no, not I. Even if you have achieved a super self-aware conscious state where you defy social pressure, you did at some point cater to the male gaze where we were all socialized to do so from a young age. This is really, really funny because when you click her profile picture, she's all made up with makeup, her nails done, her hair done. It's the same thing with another uh, book that I posted on Twitter earlier today. So there's a book called Women Don't Owe You Pretty. And the author, when you click on her name, is a gal named Florence. Her author profile is her made up with her nails, her hair, her eyelashes, her eye makeup, her hair's dyed, and it's also permed. Pretty things. So it makes me wonder, are these, are these women, these toxic feminists, trying to make other women ugly so that the sexual marketplace is less competitive for them so that they stand out more because they're making themselves up, but they're telling women to be ugly. They're telling women to learn to be comfortable with being ugly, in fact, and stick it to the male gaze. The toxic results of catering to the male gaze are evident in many ways. The insane drive for the perfect body, the obsession with social media clout, and billion dollar makeup industries. Well, these gals are paying for this. You know, they're the ones buying the makeup. They're the ones, you know, talking about these obsessions with social media clout. Um, you know, they say that attention is the is the coin of the realm in girl world, right? Women crave the attention of others. It's been said that when men use cell phones and take pictures, they're using the back camera, taking pictures of scenery and things like this, whereas women are using the selfie camera and doing stuff like this, taking their little selfie pictures. That's just a habitual trait in the differences between men and women. She goes on to say, body dysmorphia and mortality rates of BBL procedures are on the rise. One in 3,000 women die from the Brazilian butt lift surgery, making it the deadliest cosmetic procedure. One in 3,000. Well, look, go do squats, you know, uh, incorporate a good diet into your lifestyle, uh, do the kinds of exercise that develop strong and like visibly attractive glutes. Like the lazy notion that you should go and get surgery to make your butt look nicer. I don't get it when it can be done for the vast majority of women through lifestyle choices, through diet and exercise, which is far healthier. It is relatively expensive, so many women opt to travel to cheaper countries to get it done. This is not very safe. The obsession with posting the perfect picture on Instagram has also played a part in the increase in body dysmorphia. Well, <laughs> this is women. This is in female nature. Women seek validation from others. They seek validation from other women and approval. They seek validation and approval from other men. That's not gonna change, it's never gonna change. If you just happen to be a woman who does not wear makeup at all, you get odd looks and are considered an outlier. After all, who doesn't wanna slay? That's an interesting word that you hear gals use a lot today, slay. Hmm. Not only do women want a fantasy man, but we're also trying to live up to the image of a fantasy woman. It's draining. So? I mean, you know, life life requires you to do the work. Men are required to make something out of themselves. They're required to, uh, put a dent in the universe of some kind to be competent to have skills to be captivating uh, To be masculine like the list of requirements for men is significantly longer than what it is for women for women It's really just be pretty and agreeable and you know have basic feminine traits But she says that it's draining which is interesting uh, You know to look attractive high effort for low reward and the reward is even as guaranteed because we put our reward in someone else's hands That's hilarious because everything in family law is written to protect women it is. Women routinely get the vast majority of custody orders still to this day, it's over 80%. The laws that are that are written within family law through divorce encourage women to generally behave quite poorly. It encourages them to get custody, encourages the money to flow to them from the father, it encourages them and rewards them richly for alienating the father from the children and behaving badly during the divorce process. So I'm not sure why she's saying here that uh, it's low reward for women when in fact the laws factually 
are in her favor to enrich her. There's lots of guys that have lost vast majorities of their wealth to women through the divorce process. In fact, if you look at the list of the richest women in the world, the vast majority of them got their wealth either through inheritance, through their family, mostly, you know, through their father or through divorce. A good example is this woman who had a surgery to look like her boyfriend's supposed Instagram crust and he still left her. Oh, boo-hoo. You know, people leave people. It is, it is a reality of the world. I mean, if you don't have, like, you can look as beautiful as you want, but if you have a shitty uh, personality and a bad attitude towards life and you treat a guy poorly, it doesn't matter how good looking you are, a guy's going to get fed up with it. There's, you know, there's a meme out there somewhere and it's this most beautiful woman, like a 10 out of 10, and the caption says something like, somewhere some guy is tired of her shit too. So she encourages, go against the status quo, do things that make you ugly, according to the male gaze. Wear your short, natural hair. Don't wear makeup or any other beauty enhancements. Don't, dr <laughs> hilarious, again, if you click on her profile, she has her hair done, she has her makeup done, she has her nails done. This is, this is what toxic feminism is. It doesn't encourage women to become better women, to become more feminine. It's almost like these people are trying to discourage women from being attractive and from getting what they want so that the people writing these articles can get what they want by disqualifying their competition. Don't dress to turn heads, dress simply. This form of defiance against societal expectations is huge. Have fun with your cats and box wine then. I mean, you're not gonna find a guy if you don't do what's expected of you, which is be attractive. Same thing with guys, you know? I tell guys the exact same thing, like be attractive, don't be unattractive, right? Like make yourself into something. Don't be a slob, don't be fat. Uh, you know, look masculine, have a broad shoulder narrow waist ratio, the 1.62 golden ratio that I talk about in my book, The Unplugged Alpha, right? She says, you don't have to do it indefinitely, do it for a week or a month, however long it takes you to feel completely confident doing it. Take back that power and stick your fingers in the eyes of the ominous male gaze. <laughs> what the hell's wrong with these chicks? While you're doing this, it will be helpful to stay off social media as it is a big proprietor of the male. Yeah, stay off social media. In fact, one of the things that I tell guys in my red flag chapter, which by the way, you can get for free if you opt into my email list, there's 21 red flags. You don't even have to buy the book, you can get it for free. One of the red flags is women constantly seeking attention and validation online. So I agree with what she's saying here. Stay off social media. I tell guys to stay away from women that are constantly seeking validation and attention and likes and comments from the opposite sex on social media. When you return to your beloved beauty products, make sure you are wearing them for you. Less is more, a good way to tell, yeah. I agree. If you're a woman and you're wearing a ton of makeup, you look like a clown most of the time. You probably need less of it. In fact, one of the most valuable things you can do for yourself to look more beautiful and more attractive the opposite sex is not makeup, is not Brazilian buttless, is not bras, spanks, hair extensions, all this other stuff. It's don't be overweight. Be a healthy weight. Be fit. She goes on to say a good way to test this is by asking yourself, would I wear this if there were no men present? If the honest answer is yes, you're good. <laughs> Women get dressed up not just for other uh, men, they get dressed up for other women too. You know, they do seek the attention and the validation of their of their peers. Always remember you're worth much more than your perceived attractive and your looks do not determine your value. See, this is a lie. These lies that toxic feminisms tell women that, you know, you, you're worth so much more than your beauty is a load of bullshit. Again, uh, I've done so many podcasts now on the Unplugged Alpha podcast series on Ladies Night. You know, when you ask women what they bring to the table, or if you say something like, do you think that men are success objects and women are beauty objects? They get very offended, like, how dare you just reduce us down to the optics of beauty and femininity? And it's like, that's what men have always wanted throughout history. That's what we've always selected mates on. That's how we choose women is based on their beauty. The recommendation that you don't wear make makeup, that you're not feminine, that you don't behave in a beautiful and feminine way to attract the opposite sex is just going to lead to a lifetime of misery, singledom. Where have all the good men gone? You know, I've gone and I've climbed the corporate ladder and I got my degrees and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, you see it all the time in other articles not at 30, but at 40 and 50 and beyond, where, you know, these women are like, you know, I've done what I've been told, but I can't find a good man. She goes on to say romantic comedies are the primary offenders when it comes to most people's unrealistic ideals and expectations of relations. It's freaking hilarious because it's mostly women that are watching these rom-com type of movies. Disney is another primary offender, socializing us with unrealistic and downright toxic views of relationships from childhood. Disney's changing this. Um, I think Frozen was probably the first uh, show, uh, film that they put out where it was all about her and her sisterhood and the guy sort of came second or third or even fifth to that uh, narrative. Uh, since then, 
uh, Pixar and other production studios like Disney are often uh, portraying women in a light that is not conducive to good relationships and finding uh, good men. She goes on to say, distance yourself from anyone who makes you feel like your life is incomplete without a man. Her fourth point goes on to say, it's okay with being single dot 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 forever. Okay, so now she's preparing you for a life of misery, singledom, cats, and box wine. According to the happiness expert, Paul Dolan, single and child-free women are the happiest demographic of people. <laughs> That's hilarious. Then why are there so many articles out there from women over 30, 35 complaining about the misery in their life and how they climbed the corporate ladder and got their jobs and careers and degrees and their Ikea furniture and all their canvas prints on the walls and all that stuff and they're, and they're miserable because they don't have a man, right? She says romantic relationships are overrated. That's not to say they're terrible, but there's so much media hype around them. Reality just doesn't match up. Being okay with being single forever is one of the biggest ways to know if you have successfully decentered from men. You have broken out of the stronghold that has held many women back, the fear of being alone, or is looked down upon. It's always going to be looked down upon. You know, there's you know there's a reason why they call women spinsters when they age out of the dating marketplace, and it makes it nearly uh, impossible, if not very difficult, to find a guy to uh, be with on a permanent basis or a long-term basis anyway. I mean, if romantic relationships are so overrated then why are there constantly women watching you know movies in rom-coms and all these like smut love mo novels and romance mo novels and even things like 50 shades of gray one of the best-selling books of all time uh, is basically about a woman yielding to a man's strong frame and submitting to him again always watch women's behavior not what they say. Watch what people are doing. Watch what women are doing versus what they're saying. There's always been a strong social stigma associated with being an unmarried woman. In the 1960s, single women were called spinsters. They're still called spinsters today, by the way, gals. The word spinster refers to an unmarried woman is often used in a negative context, depicting spinsters as unwanted. It's because they are unwanted. They've, they've aged themselves out, you know? A woman's primary value to a guy on, on the sexual marketplace is her beauty and her ability to bring him children so he can pass on his DNA and his name. That is her primary value to men. And if they spend their, you know, 20s and 30s uh, climbing the corporate ladder, getting degrees, buying IKEA furniture, decorating their house, getting fluffy white dogs and cats and all kinds of stuff, they're going to they're going to age themselves out of the sexual marketplace. Their value is going to diminish. It's not the same for men. You know, men can uh, find women in their 40s and 50s that are that that still have youth, that can still have children. There's lots of famous actors. In fact, I was just reading an article about Robert De Niro, who I don't know what is he in the 70s or 80s. He's got a uh, girlfriend in her 40s that's raising his kid Robert De Niro another you know world famous actor uh, also in his 80s I think he just had a kid with a 20 something year old you know his girlfriend's raising his uh, child as well when you are fine being single you come from a position of power and not helplessness you set high standards for yourself and maintain boundaries with confidence stop wasting precious time fantasizing about men again have fun with your box wine and cat collection guys invest in cat food you'll probably make quite a bit of money over the long term and her final point says realize that men are human they eat, they shit, and they sleep. They cheat, they lie, and they steal. So do women. So what's your point? Uh, they disappoint. You make a man the center of your life. You will never live to your full expectations, and that's okay because he is a human. No more dating a man just because. That's. I mean, that's kind of a reasonable take. I mean, she's not hating that badly on it. It's just that she's she's putting so much distance between women and and what they're after. And it's, again, almost like she's trying to disqualify them so that she has a better opportunity to get what she's want. You know, it's like rules for thee, but not for me sort of thing. Like, don't look beautiful, but here's a picture of me looking beautiful. She says women also tend to carry the bulk of the mental, emotional, and domestic load in a relationship, especially if they have kids. That's not so much true today, but it's been that way in the past. And honestly, it works that way. Uh, you know, it's, it's always worked best, in my opinion, where men subscribe to blue jobs and women do the pink jobs. He goes out, brings home the bacon, she cooks it up, she raises the the kids and takes care of things that way and to be honest with you I find most women out there in that role tend to be happiest it's only when toxic feminists lie to women and say things like you know put that off delay it climb the corporate ladder get get degrees uh, you'll be happier doing that serving a man in the corporate world lining his pockets with gold rather than serving a man and your children in your house and then she goes on to say with big underlines and bold statistics show that a whopping 86 percent of women carry the mental load 86 percent of the working moms say they handle all family and household responsibilities this does not change even if the woman is the breadwinner so 
why why make women the breadwinner like why try to make women terrible versions of men like why why do we suck them into the workplace i'll tell you why it's because the government the state and culture has this drive to control you go go in the workplace so we can tax you more so we can control you more so we can raise your kids put your kids in our school system so we can brainwash them with our bullshit and our wokeness that's what they're trying to do you know they're the the state is trying to destroy the fabric of family and civilization by becoming the head of the household is what ends up happening and it's totally fine for you know for women to take on the bulk of the mental load of being a mother because they're the mother right like they have the girl parts that's what they're supposed to do she says if you have any experience dating men you've probably had one or a few relationships that rubbed you the wrong way you probably swore off men really i was in before that it's not just men blah 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 if you've dated a narcissist or a selfish person that tried to control you belittle you approach it yeah control you like control you how you know for example you know if you're a guy dating gals and you say something you know to a woman who wants to choose you you know she's like you know where do we stand i want to claim you i'm not seeing anybody else other guys are invisible where is this going can we be in a relationship and then he were to say something that i would encourage him to say by looking at their social media and saying well i like you but I can't deal with a woman or take a woman seriously that is, you know, posting provocative pictures online and social media looking for the attention of other guys. Like, is that controlling? Is it controlling when a guy says, you know, something like, well, I like you too, but I can't take a woman seriously, for example, that keeps men from her past around. You know, you can't be hanging out with the guys that you were banging in the past that were friends with benefits that you were engaged to, that you were dating and having lunch and dinner with them, you know, sort of thing. It just doesn't make any sense. That's not controlling. That's having reasonable boundaries as a guy, especially if he's leading the relationship. Anyway, she wraps it up. Work for your health, your happiness, validate yourself, your self worth of self, blah, blah, blah. You know, it, it's the standard stuff. Anyway, let's get on the road and have a little bit of a conversation about this notion because it is what it is. All right, well, you know, this is a story that I've been seeing for years now. So the decentering of man, I think, is just another word for toxic feminism, as I've described it before. Um, feminism as a movement in the decades past was about equality. Uh, given women the opportunity to vote, to drive a car, you know, basic fundamental things, which I'm totally fine with. Where it goes off the rails, where it turns into a supremacy movement, you know, where it turns into this kind of supremacy movement that's all about the destruction and the subjugation of men to a certain agenda. Uh, bend the knee, become less so she can become more, you know, like this sort of stuff. And I don't think that that's good. It's not good for women, it's certainly not good for men. It's not good for bringing those two things together. The problem with this article, the decentering of men, is it's just the same typical standard narrative. You don't need no man, go climb the corporate ladder, stop wearing makeup, stop making yourself look pretty, cut your hair short, don't worry about your weight, you're beautiful at any weight, you know, like the standard sort of stuff. And that's not what men want. Uh, women, know, women inherently know this. You know, when they see this shit, they're like all about, yeah, you go girl and afford it. And like, again, this is the number one article right now on Google. It is number one on Google for decentering men. It's right at the top. So how is that serving you ladies? You know, is a question that I would be asking the gals. You know, I'd be asking this woman a question. How is that working out for you? And you know, the truth of the matter is it doesn't. These sorts of narratives lead to unhappy women on SSRIs and antidepressants and again, you know, I've seen these gals on my shows, on the Unplugged Alpha podcast, that channel, if you're not subscribed to it, go over to it. There's a series that I've been building on called Ladies Night, and in just about every single show now, and we've been doing these for a few months, every single show has women on it that aren't getting what, they're, you know, what they want. They're single, they've made some terrible choices in life that haven't got them you know, the results that they've wanted, and they're sitting there wondering why. And when you ask them questions like why, then, you know, their answers start going, well, you know, the right guy will come along at some point, or I'm not entirely sure, or it's all men's fault. And it's like, you know, when you start pushing and you asking them questions like, okay, well, what can you do to become better? And it's like, you know, it's like a deer in the headlights, like, huh? Like, what do you mean? Like, I, like, what do I have to do? Like, or, you know, you ask them a question like, well, what do you bring to the table? Huh? What do you mean, what do I bring to the table? Uh, I'm a part-time nighttime supervisor at Wendy's and I don't understand why women don't like my strong independent mode and why they can't handle me sort of thing. And it's like, you know, guys are starting to tune into this sort of stuff when they hear shit like, you know, can you handle me? Or I'm not the kind of gal that you can just sort of push around or I'm a lot of women. It's like these standard narratives are just like these disagreeable boss bitches that 
the strong, virtuous men that these gals want. They want the tall guys that are successful, that are putting a dent in the universe, that can lead, that know how to make money, that are competent, that can fix it, that are influential, blah, blah, blah. Like they're a long laundry list of 300 points. The guys that they want are denying them and disqualifying them based on their past. Stupid things. I remember I had this conversation once and I'll wrap up on this point. There was a gal on one of my shows and she was telling me that uh, one of her friends was widowed and you know she was widowed and what she did was she tattooed some sort of memento on her body to commemorate her uh, deceased uh, husband and you know I looked at her funny and I said to her well don't you think that's problematic and she didn't understand why and I said well look you know she she's the very definition now of an alpha widow She's a, she's, a, she's a woman that holds a place in her heart for another man, and I would advise men at that point not to take a chick like that seriously. Like, why would you take a woman seriously that has marked and scarred her body with some sort of memento, some sort of tribute to a guy from her past? It doesn't matter if he's alive or not. I don't care what the circumstances are around him going, but that's not a, that's not a wise choice. That is an unwise choice for men to invite into their life, and it's also an unwise decision for her to expect men to overlook or to praise. You know, she was she was upset that we as men aren't praising that behavior to celebrate this memento. It doesn't make any sense. But again, that's girl world, you know? That's how they operate. They operate within the notion of feelings. You know, it, it's always feelings first. Well, I just feel like, and you notice when you talk to women, they almost always start conversations and statements with, well, I just feel like, you know, my past shouldn't matter. You should overlook my past or any any one of those things. And it's simply not true because we as men need to be very, very careful about her past and her choices. We should evaluate her based on her past because she, as a woman, is very, very interested in your future as a guy, your ability to preside, to, to protect, to lead, to take care of the family and her, right? Like this is what they expect of you in your future. So again, you know, the decentering of men it just sounds like another word or another name for toxic feminism. It's not going to serve women. Women that adopt this mindset and subscribe to it, I don't think are going to go very far. You guys tell me what you think in the comments below. What has your experience been? I'll uh, also link this uh, particular article so you can read it for yourself if you like. See you guys in the next video pinned in the top comment below. There's a bunch of useful links to my book, my community, to the event that I'm holding in January 2024. So if you want to meet me up in Toronto, take a look at that. We'll see you guys later. Peace out. I don't ever slow up. No, I don't take shit. I got no love for the fakeness. If you want to play tough and want to hate this, I'll always show up.